So I'm delighted to open the, the next session, which is uh, on the digital society and the sharing economy. Maybe some of you are wondering why we are devoting a session to the digital society and the sharing economy in a conference which is on smart and sustainable cities. Well, we believe that smart and sustainable lifestyles require a major shift in patterns of consumption. Increased well-being using current patterns of consumption will not bring sustainability, but increased pressures on resources. The sharing economy offers a different model of consumption, using connectivity now available in a digital society, and by shifting from the ownership of multiple goods to accessing goods, space, skills, and services as needed. Sharing could offer a major transformation to using fewer goods, less energy, fewer material resources, and consequently generates less emissions and maybe less waste. There are indications that this is happening. There are some results from uh, research like that from uh, Susan Shaheen of Berkeley, who has indicated that sharing mobility has brought about a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. However, we need much more research on that. And the question then is, are people willing to share? Will convenience, lower costs, and social engagement attract users and suppliers beyond the millennials who are the main users of the sharing platforms today? And who are the agents of change who frame social norms affecting consumer behavior in a digital society? What are the implications of the digital world on lifestyles? Is sharing or collaborative consumption a temporary trend, or does it signal a fundamental change of societal values away from the throwaway society? Our panel is going to address these and other issues. So let me introduce I'm myself, Valerie Brachia. I'm a researcher at the Jerusalem Institute for Israel Studies and I lecture in the Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University on uh, sustainability and environmental planning, and I was a previous Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Environmental Protection in Israel. And we have three eminent experts with us on the panel today. We have Professor Shizaf Rifaeli, Professor Charles Steinfeld, and Mr. Peter Marks, and I'm going to introduce each one of them uh, in, in turn now as they come uh, to join and to make a presentation. And I hope we will have some time for some questions, answer, and some dialogue within the time scale of this session. So first, our first speaker will be Professor Shizaf Rifaeli, and he is from the Graduate School of Management and is the founding director of the Center for Internet Research at Haifa University. He will bring to the dialogue insights from research on electronic business information studies, computer-mediated communication, social networks and their analysis, computer-mediated collaboration and online games and simulation. He's not only widely published in the academic world, but he's also a consultant to citizen countries around the world, and he's actually on his way to China now. So please let us welcome Professor Shizaf Rifaeli. Valerie, very kind. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I guess I'm the first speaker who's not directly involved in either energy, water, construction, or sustainability. Uh, my field uh, is probably best defined in returning to what I've been doing for the last decade, which was being a dean in a school of management, where I repeatedly reminded our students that managing is about three things. It's about physical assets that have constraints and opportunities. We talked a lot about physical assets today. It's about people and their behavior and preferences, and we talked a lot about people. And the third leg of that stool, the third thing that management and organizations, and in fact our future depends on, in addition to physical and human, the third aspect is information. And the word information has not yet been mentioned today here. And my point, uh, if I had to summarize it in one sentence today, 
will be that if you're aiming for sustainability, and in particular if you're aiming for smart sustainability, and if you want to achieve this through sharing, that is, if it's sustainability that is smart and is achieved through sharing, you need to focus, in addition to the physical and the human, you need to focus increasingly in our day and age on information and its attributes. And so what I'd like to try to do is to introduce a series of concepts as pegs that you can hang your thinking on with regards to information in sharing for a smart, sustainable future. I'm going to try to talk about thinking different. I'm going to try to mention a few things about the disruption brought about, brought about by recent developments in the digital world. Elaborate on this notion of atoms to bits. I'm going to talk about disintermediation and reintermediation. I'd like to mention the notions of platform replacing pipeline, something that I think Chip, who will speak after me, is going to elaborate more about. I'll, if time permits, I'll say a few things about packet switching and centrality. And I'd like to conclude with some ideas about the information economy and how it reflects on the possibility of sharing. At the very end of my talk, I'll make some references to some reading materials that might be worthwhile to pursue if anyone wants to look further into this idea of information in addition to people and physical resources and constraints in the search for sustainability. In the search for sustainability, we're looking for uh, whatever strategies we can find. Some of these strategies might be symbolic, uh, so if you want to encourage people to use more bikes and you want to show that uh, bicycles uh, are maybe make more sense than cars, uh, you might want to use uh, tools like this that indicate how many parking spaces are saved by using how many bikes. Uh, coming from Israel, I always like to go back to very distant past history. This is uh, a, an aerial view of a uh, very ancient city in Iran Fayuzabad, one of the first uh, towns to have been documented as being built in a circle. And this notion of a circle as the way to construct a community is a notion that is worth looking at, if for no other reason than for the reason that many communities use this circle model. There's Fayuzabad in, in Shiraz in Iran, there is Sun City, uh, there are areas of Mexico City. Notice how they're all about this circular design, maybe with some thinking about sharing. But the reason I brought these pictures, uh, here's a fourth or fifth picture of a community in Denmark that is also uh, arraigned in, in circles. The reason I brought this is to say all of these circular communities or semi-urban arrangements that are arranged in a circle, all of them have fairly empty centers. The circles are around a commons that is a park. And the idea of sharing could be served by such an empty center for people to meet, but then the only thing you share is information. There's yet another community, uh, this is a community in Israel called Nahalal, that was out, actually built out of some disillusionment and disappointment in sharing. The very beginning of the 20th century, over 100 years ago, the first communal settlements were set up in Israel, socialist settlements that were built before World War I. And some of the refugees of those settlements who were unhappy with how communal or how sharing behavior took place there built this particular settlement that is iconic also in its circular context. But this one, very different from all the other ones that we looked at, this one has almost everything that is important in the center. There are no greens, no commons. It's the central production facilities and the central education facilities and the central governmental facilities in the center. This indicates that we can and should think different about how we share and what it is we share in living arrangements. We should think different because this is becoming an information age. It's becoming an information age with the decline of the percentage of people engaged in working in agriculture down to an almost negligible single digit percentage. It's becoming an information age because the rise in the percentage of 
industrial and service workers has also been slowing down and what has grown exponentially in the last very few decades is the percentage of those people working in information. Working in information is a fact that frames many of the aspects of our lives, including the sustainability aspects. The fact that more than 50% of the modern workforce gains its livelihood not from making food or things directly, not from touching or being in touch with products or services or clients, but rather from facing screens, from dealing with data rather than things, this fact cannot be left alone, must be mentioned when we discuss sustainability. It's for this reason that this is what our fifth panel today, and the term information has not yet been mentioned, I think it's important that we mention it. It's important that we mention it without getting carried away. Some people get carried away. For example, the author of this slide, not mine, calls the information age the biggest shift since the Industrial Revolution. The argument that the information age is the biggest shift since the Industrial Revolution is a fairly bold, maybe extreme argument. It's an argument that says nothing that happened between the Industrial Revolution and the information age appearance is as important. So, uh, the appearance of nuclear weapons and energy and the appearance of the car and the appearance of the airplane and so forth are all less important than the information age in the eyes of the author of this slide. But I'd like to argue that whether you agree with this argument or not, the importance of this being an information age, the importance of this being an age where most of us not only need information as input, but most of us make information as major output, the fact that we produce information is a major frame for the way we live, the way we need to plan, the way we need to organize. It's information in and of itself, and it's the information flows that should help us redesign the way we live. And there are some ideas, very few of them originally mine, that help us take this idea one step further towards sustainability. Maybe the single most important idea is the idea that in the information age, physical things recede and their representation in digital form come to the forefront. Atoms get pushed away by bits. This is true for the economic value of things. We increasingly pay more for bits than we do for atoms. This is true for the value level of discussion. It's true for the political and social arrangements. And it's true, most importantly, for the way we conduct our lives. When we worry about water or energy or building or wind or transportation, as we have throughout the day today, we're worrying about physical things and as well we should. But we should remember that in our age, these physical things are taking a slightly less important role because information that represents things is becoming more important. And in one field after another, one institutional arrangement after another, one market after another, we can see how bits are taking the place of atoms. And designing for sustainability, thinking about sustainability, arranging for sustainability requires that we think not just about water and transportation and energy and such, we should think about information as an important aspect, maybe more important than others. So atoms are replacing bits. Here's another idea, the idea that because we have more and more efficient ways of communicating, because we can move these bits from one place to another place around the world at almost zero cost, because control C, control V is available for those bits and they weren't available for most atoms. Because of all of that, we can maybe shorten the value chain. We can disintermediate. And if you think about the way our lives are arranged, including the way urban settings are organized, they have always been organized by elevating the mediator to a, a major central position. And if we're witnessing an age when 
the arrangement, the network, allows us to leap over the mediator. We can buy directly from the source. We can communicate directly to the source. If we can leap over the intermediate steps, if we can disintermediate, we are facing a new situation. More importantly, if we discover that this promise of disintermediation was a false promise, and what an, in effect is happening is a re-intermediation at a scale that we've never seen before, if instead of disintermediating and allowing us to buy directly from the manufacturer in a faraway country, what we have are huge new mediators that didn't exist before, at a scale that didn't exist before. We've already heard Google and Uber and Airbnb mentioned here in this room today. If there are new, unprecedentedly strong mediators and there's re-intermediation, that becomes even more important for our discussion of bits and sustainability. There's a fairly new book out, and I'll recommend that book soon, that discusses the role of platforms. If in the physical world, where when we're interested in planning, we discuss things like regulation and zoning and urban planning, if in the physical world, what we did was to think about the value chain, think about the pipeline, in energy terms and water terms, the pipeline is clearly what we're talking about, but this is also true for transportation. It's also true for other aspects of sustainable life. If we focused on the pipeline, we should now focus, says this idea, there's a Harvard Business Review uh, piece that summarizes it, we should now focus just as much on the platforms. Because in an age when what we have are more bits and these bits are becoming as important or even more important than atoms, the platform that organizes these bits becomes more important than the pipeline in terms of planning. I'd like to suggest a short list of concepts that one can take as take-homes if you accept the idea that information should be just as important in deliberations about sustainability. I'd like to suggest that we should take seriously this discussion of utopia versus dystopia. Whether we like it or not, the world is becoming more and more digital. Whether we like it or not, bits are becoming more important. We need to focus on whether this is good or bad, even if we can't control it. The mayor talked about the dystopic aspects of digital and postmodern world. We should also, also think about utopic aspects of digital world. One metaphor I suggest you keep in mind is this metaphor of socialists at the beginning of the 20th century in Israel, those who founded the first kibbutz, communal settlements, leaving the kibbutz in uh, disappointment because the sharing that went on in the kibbutz was a little bit too much for them, moving to something else that was more circular, such as the Na'alal uh, idea. So utopia versus dystopia. Second idea I suggest we take with us is to think seriously about whether technology is deterministic. We heard throughout the day several times people suggesting that it's not the technology. I heard this from at least five different speakers saying it's not the technology. I'm not going to take issue with that argument, but I think we should ask ourselves, well, if it's not the technology, are we really living the same lives we did 50 years ago? If we're thinking about networks, and if we're thinking about sharing, we should think about network effects. Network effects are an idea that I think uh, Chip is going to talk more about, I, I, I assume. Uh, but they're a central concept in economics that has only, have only risen once networks have become central to our lives. And I'd like to argue that they have not, those networks have not yet become central enough to our lives. We, for example, in, re in research and methodology, are still thinking in pre-network terms. We're still thinking in terms of average and standard deviation, and too few of us are thinking in terms of network measures. There was some discussion of density from the physical perspective. There was no mention, and lots of percentage and average measures uh, thrown out today in this room. There was not a single mention of network measures of human density, of betweenness, 
of outline of terms that we are now, 20 years into the age of network science, able to measure. We still don't even teach these things as required subjects in undergraduate education. Every undergraduate knows what a standard deviation is. Very few know what a betweenness is. And in a network age, we should be thinking in network terms. I'd like to suggest that the ideas of gaming and gamification brought to us by various industries in the digital world are crucially important in an information-focused world and in a network, networked society. And if you're going to talk about behavior change, as we've begun to do in the last two hours, gaming and gamification, with their pretty sides and with their ugly sides, should be mentioned. Likewise, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding are ideas that are very important for the discussion of sustainability. The idea that it's not all central planners, nor is it renegades that go out into the mountains, but there is some new way of organizing through crowdfunding and crowdsourcing are essential ideas that could only have hatched in a network digital age. And once they've hatched, they need to play an important role in a discussion of sustainability. I can hardly think of an issue in sustainability from transportation to energy to water and so forth that doesn't have an important angle from the point of view of crowd participation. Some of the interesting innovations in sustainability and in running our lives are innovations that started with realizing crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. Another word I haven't heard at all and I think is incredibly important in discussion of sustainability and is related to the digital world is this notion of privacy. And we've spent an entire day here and privacy has not been raised. We cannot think about regulation and rearrangement and mapping and resetting and so forth in aspects so central to our lives without thinking about privacy and drawing the conclusions that are required. Likewise, we need to think about property. If this is a digital world and if things are so incredibly easy to copy and share or steal, then the idea of property in a world where more things are not physical and therefore easy to copy, the idea of property needs to be re-examined. This will lead to some serious novel thinking about business models. And the idea of business models is inextric inextricably connected to the idea of sustainability. And lastly, because this is an information age and because of all of these qualities of uh, atoms to bits and disintermediation or reintermediation and platforms rather than pipelines and the idea of needing to make decisions about utopia or dystopia and the ideas of needing to make decisions about technological determ determinism. Because of all of these, the ideas of equity, fairness, and gaps need to take central stage again. And this is the opportunity to think about this, the digital gaps between North and South globally, the digital gaps between generations, the digital gaps between sections of the society, and so forth. I'd like to end with recommendation for five books, only one of which I was involved in writing, and only two of which I agree with. <laughs> but I think they are very worthwhile reading, especially if you disagree with them. The book on the upper left-hand corner, Network and Netplay, is our take from 20 years ago about networks and netplay, uh, MIT Press. And uh, even though it's almost the, the book is almost 20 years old, uh, it has the flavor of what information brings to the discussion of sustainability. The book in the center, uh, Yochai Benkler from Harvard Law School, uh, The Penguin and the Leviathan, may be the most eloquent spokesperson of the changes brought about by digital life. Yochai comes from a legal background, and he is a very avid, excited fan of sharing. If you want to read the ultimate statement about sharing, Benkler. And the last three books, uh, sharing from a critical perspective, what's yours is mine, and the sharing economy, and uh, a book just published three weeks ago called The Platform Revolution. Thank you.
uh, as uh, Shizaf has moved us from atoms to from 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 bits from atoms to bits. There's another phrase I heard. Are you going to move us from bricks to clicks? Yeah. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, Shizaf just reminded me that uh, because he talked a little bit about uh, intermediation and reintermediation and disintermediation. Uh, we wrote an article about this, I think it was 1995. And, um, and so it was a thing even back then, and it's still a thing. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about, I want to take some of the uh, concepts that Shazaf uh, brought to the table and uh, make them a little bit more concrete and very specific about sharing economy business models. And um, so that's uh, my contribution today is to give us a little bit of insight into what's happening uh, with some of the sharing economy businesses uh, and how they're organized. I think the first point I'd like to make is that uh, there's a huge diversity in sharing economy services that are out there. Uh, I'm sure there are people in here, almost everyone in here has used at least one of them. Uber users, raise your hand. Yeah, okay, Lyft, et cetera, uh, Airbnb. Everyone knows these services. Um, but. Sharing economy services go much beyond Airbnb and Uber and Lyft. Uh, they, they vary. They could be services. Uh, the questions we have to ask about these, these models are, are we talking about goods and services that are sold? Are they rented? Are they swapped? Are they loaned? Uh, so there are many different arrangements. And the appropriate business models are not always the same for these. Um, we also uh, hear a lot about sharing economy being largely peer-to-peer. -peer. And I would uh, submit to you that they aren't all peer-to-peer. -peer. Many of them are peer-to-peer -peer services. It's people sharing what they have with other people in neighborhoods, let's say. But uh, there are plenty of services that link people to businesses. They're fee-based services, and they they're certainly have characteristics of sharing. And then there are others that no one really talks about in the literature on sharing economy that are strictly business to business, and I'd like to make sure that we're aware of those. Um, the other, a, a third dimension I'd want to point out is that uh, the exchanges that have developed to, uh, that we call sharing economy services, uh, take different forms fr from a geographical point of view. Now, many of them are very local and community-based. In fact, some of them are hyper-local. They're very neighborhood-focused. Uh, and others are more global. And then others are sort of something in between. They're, they're almost like franchise models. You know, we have uh, uh, Uber in many different cities, for example. So we need to look at these various arrangements. Across all these arrangements, uh, the same core functions do exist. Uh, they have always existed for online marketplaces. We, we've studied this and talked about this in the 1990s. And they're still there. So every uh, service needs to uh, perform an aggregation function. You need to achieve a critical mass of users. Sometimes it's a two-sided market problem. You have to have providers, enough providers to attract users, and you have to have enough users to attract the providers. It often can be a chicken and egg problem, but you have to solve the aggregation problem. All of these services have a trust problem. Well, we know this. This is, again, from the, from the dawn of e-commerce, and services like eBay, we need, uh, we need to solve the trust function. And often that's about feedback systems, but in sharing economy uh, systems, we have to go beyond just feedback systems. We may need to provide other forms of trust per, uh, through uh, qualification, through background checks, and things like that. Uh, a third core dimension or function that has to be uh, solved is the f to facilitate trade. You need to lower transaction costs, and you need to provide tools that will make trade happen uh, seem, uh, frictionlessly. And so that could be online payment integration. Uh, it could be escrow and insurance services. So there, that's uh, certainly all of these are, are useful. And then finally, one of the most important functions is the matching function, which Shazaf uh, also alluded to, that you, you we're finding ways to connect idle assets with those who have who are seeking access to those assets. And the interesting thing in, in what seems to differentiate sharing economy services from many of the earlier forms of electronic marketplaces is they're very location-based. So that's one of the ways that we match is by location. 
Uh, of course, to solve the aggregation problem, you're encouraging participation. And this, there have been some preliminary studies about what motivates people to participate in a sharing economy. What motivates people to loan their goods to other people? Well, uh, the research suggests that you have to look at both intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. So you have to, of course, there are uh, the intrinsic motivations uh, around sustainability and people wanting to do good. The, the millennials uh, seem to be motivated by this, but it, actually the research shows that it's also about having fun, it's about enjoyment, and the extrinsic motivations are the, among the strongest predictors of participation. That is, people need to anticipate that they will benefit economically. And so if you don't have that, then the gains uh, uh, aren't exceeding the perceived costs, and these marketplaces will fail. In fact, a few months ago, Fast Company, one of the uh, blogs that writes about sharing economy, actually declared it dead. Uh, the sharing economy is dead, and we all killed it. Why, how? Because we uh, were apathetic. We said, wow, great idea, but then we didn't want to loan our goods to anybody else. <laughs> so, uh, it turns out that sharing platforms are very costly to develop and maintain. Uh, they make sense uh, at scale, and so there's a pressure to achieve scale, and so the ones that are succeeding are the ones that, uh, that, that hit the low-hanging fruit. So when there's, you, you find uh, industries that are uh, ripe for disruption, like transportation and lodging, so I've got a graph that shows, you know, for a three-star hotel in New York in 2014, the average price you paid was over $350. Well, no family can afford that for a vacation. So that's ripe for disruption. These tend to be regulated industries. There's limited supply, high demand, and they're fee-based services. But for the sharing economy services that many of us got, get real excited about, uh, you know, the loaning and swapping and so forth, uh, it's a lot more uh, difficult to, to have a platform that, that we can afford. And oftentimes, uh, services like some of you may remember Snap Goods, which is a subject of many a TED talk. Uh, well, Snap Goods, you know, uh, if you go to their site today, to their domain, you'll get the, uh, this web uh, page is available uh, from GoDaddy. I mean, it's gone. Snap Goods disappeared in 2012. So services often start out very well intentioned and then they have to pivot. They have to find a, a viable business model. So how, for entrepreneurs, how do they get started? Well, they, oftentimes, if you don't have the in-house uh, expertise, you're going to use a do-it-yourself uh, so-called white label application. And e there are many e-commerce applications. There are hundreds of e-commerce applications. They don't require uh, any programming expertise. They, you can get your online storefront up for under $30 a month. It's easy. Uh, but these are very simple types of applications in, in the sense that it's just one seller and many buyers. Well, this is not a sharing economy marketplace. Some of these applications will let you plug in modules and where you can have multiple vendors, but it's still, then it's a few sellers and many buyers. It's still not a sharing economy marketplace. The do-it-yourself uh, marketplace providers, uh, the platform providers, as Shizoff talked a lot about platforms, well, they're a lot less common and they require a lot more expertise and they're way more costly. So you have uh, entities like Near Me or Structured Domain or, or Marketplace Inc. Uh, they're pretty expensive. You'll spend thousands of dollars a month to use their services. And uh, uh, the one that's, that is now the darling of the sharing economy industry, that's ShareTribe. Uh, it's a Finnish organization. And they have hundreds of, of sharing economy marketplaces out there, and you can get started for about $39 a month. But it's limited, it's much more for neighborhood type applications, because they limit uh, you to 300 members for their low end services. Um, so apart from the platform though, you have the entrepreneur who wants the sharing economy marketplace, and they have to have their own business model. Now usually it depends on transaction fees, that's the, the old tried and true standard. Um, and so all of these uh, platforms will build in uh, transaction processing and payment gateways and all those good things. Uh, but if, you're a, if you want to start a community for swapping and loaning and neighborhood type of, of services, well, you know, those aren't really uh, oriented to the way you want your service to run. And just having a good design, as we saw from the Fast Company article, isn't really enough. And you have to find ways to support uh, development and hosting, maintenance, marketing, 
all the human uh, activities that help you build a community. Uh, the typical ways that these communities get, uh, get started and finance themselves uh, are through donations. Uh, Shazak mentioned crowdfunding. That's a very common way that some of these more uh, sharing economy services get going. They can also uh, rely on large donor support or support from cities. I think we'll hear about that. They may be sponsored from businesses. Uh, or what normally happens is they undergo the famous pivot and they offer value-added services like protection uh, and insurance services. Um, just a few final thoughts about uh, sustainability. Uh, I would encourage us to, uh, the, in the, the rhetoric in the sharing economy books is about uh, essentially uh, buying less and consuming less. And, uh, and I think we have to be careful about that kind of rhetoric because it, it, it puts you in a uh, sort of a hostile relationship with the business community. And I think e-commerce has generally hurt local businesses. Uh, it was all about bypassing business. And so the loss of local retail actually can diminish our quality of life. We can lament uh, you know, the loss of local retail. So, but, but the sharing economy does offer some interesting uh, ways to think about interacting with local business. Um, it has a local focus and it has mobile features, so that foregrounds the local business community. I'll just mention a couple of sites. Uh, you know, one area where businesses are very prevalent are the food rescue sites. Uh, you know, zero percent, these are sites where food retailers donate food to food pantries and sharing economy services work well there. They tend to be uh, supported by donations. There are many other good uh, models that we can talk about. We'll hear about the transport ones, uh, but I just wanted to bring some of those to your attention. Uh, let, I will just uh, close uh, by uh, one uh, plea for thinking about sharing economy in marginalized uh, and low-income communities uh, because they have very special characteristics as well that aren't well served by sharing economy services as currently configured. Uh, there isn't necessarily a safe place to exchange goods and services. Uh, you have to perhaps consider better ways to build trust and social capital in these kinds of communities. And so these are some policy issues that we could talk about. And I'll close with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. And now let us go to a practical aspect. And we're delighted that uh, Peter Marks, who is the Chief Innovation Technology Officer of the City of Los Angeles, he comes from the world of business and has been promoting innovative ideas and technologies. And then he was appointed by Mayor Garcetti as the city's first Chief Innovation Technology Officer. So, Peter. What does the local authority do about it, and where is Los Angeles in this picture? So all good technology people have to plug in their own stuff. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, I came out of UCLA. Uh, I did my degrees here. And um, I think literally from like grammar school, I think I went to grammar school over there, and high school over there, and <laughs> so on. And um, so it's nice to be here. Uh, and. If you will, sorry, we're good. Um, I'll just frame it in the following way, which is I, I spent a lot of time writing software for the medical world and for entertainment and interactivity. In fact, I, I did a, I, before I had gray hair and was wearing a tie, I did a, a bunch of things called video games, as an example. And I was the CTO for a video game called World of Warcraft, which has roughly the same population as Los Angeles. Uh, and none of the issues about sustainability, tra well, anyway. <laughs> um, so I figured that I would take us through some very, very real world uh, discussion about the sharing economy and about cities, but from a very, you know, frankly, technology data driven perspective. And I'm just going to take you through some of the stuff that's been happening here in Los Angeles. Uh, but I'll do it with, uh, with uh, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards or raise your hand or whatever you'd like to do. And as the mayor said, uh, and by the way, isn't he just a fantastic speaker? I mean, he's just, we have to, we have to take a picture of people clapping and, and you know, Instagram it to him. Uh, by the way, he has a large Instagram following too. Um, but the, the mayor, as part of his uh, speech today, he mentioned that more people are living in cities than are living outside. 
And this is an audience, I think everybody already understands this, but that wasn't true very long ago. Just a few years ago, there were fewer people living in cities. But why are people living in cities? Well, they're safer. They're places where you can raise your kids. They're places where you can get jobs, get education. You know, it, cities are where people are, right? They're actually the ultimate example of a sharing economy. So this whole new concept of the digital sharing economy is sort of strange when you think about the whole reason for cities to exist is for us to share things like roads, police forces, you know, all that. But that said, let's talk about this particular city, which is very, very large. So um, as an example, we, we starting uh, a couple years ago, uh, Mary Garcetti as his third executive directive asked all, well actually directed, told everybody, because we do have some authority, uh, to go and tell all the departments to go and share all the data that they have locked away in these old closets disguised as old computer systems and make it available to, well, everybody, all of you. And so, in, in fact, Yu sung Yi, who was just here earlier, was part of our original announcement in 2014 where we started publishing data. Uh, and, and I'll get a little bit further into it. But there's a lot of information that the city government, that the city has, that is useful to all of you. Yet, I hate to put it, no, most of that information shows up through intermediaries, newspapers, or maybe it shows up on signs that are painted or something like that. Really hard to get information out that's relevant to us as individuals. But we did a little project with Google where we started doing civic notifications about a year and a half ago. Uh, little things, like for example, if it's gonna rain tomorrow, we sent you, you know, if you do a search in Google and you live or work or reside uh, or visit Los Angeles, in your search results or on your Android phone or in your Google app, you'll get a little notification saying, hey, maybe it's a good idea to turn off your sprinklers tomorrow. Uh, or for example, the zoo is looking for volunteers. Or if we're gonna close a really big street, like for Ciclavia, which we did over the weekend, where we close the street to all traffic. And so we tell everybody within a mile of the street, uh, that's 1.4 kilometers for everybody else, uh, that, that you can expect that street to be closed, and oh, by the way, this is how you get across it. And these notifications have been really popular. And they're just subtle, they just sure show up, you know, you don't have to opt in because we don't know anything about you and you're not trading any information. But they're designed to give you relevant personal information that connects you to your city. Because it is, after all, your city, right? So um, on a wider scale, we now publish more than 1,000 data sets uh, that are just available for free through two portals. One is data.lacd.org. The other one is GeoHub. The geohub.lacd.org is a collection of GIS data. It's 520 data sets of everything from well, where crimes happen, where the streetlights are, uh, where those parking tickets were issued yesterday, things like that. And that data is useful for sustainability on a wide scale because, quite frankly, we talk about sustainability um, and we do you know, magnificent work to go and intuitively increase our fuel efficiency or decrease our carbon emissions and things like that. But to a certain degree, we've been doing it in the blind on theoretic, academic, uh, you know, studies and measurements of ideal situations and all the rest of it. Well, here's an example where the city is actually giving you back lots and lots of data that's useful for things like sustainability. And it's very much a key part of something like this. This is the first annual update to the sustainability plan that was published last year for LA. In fact, this is hot off the press. It came out last week. And Mary Garcetti uh, started this. Matt Peterson, who's the chief sustainability officer, uh, you know, in his group created this sustainability plan for LA and here's the first update. And a lot of the stuff that's in here is coming off of data that we now publish through the open data portal. So where does that data come from? Well, I mentioned crusty old computers, but there's some really advanced ones. Like this is the control system for the traffic system, for the traffic, you know, sorry, for the transportation across LA. We have a highly computerized traffic management system called ATSEC. 45,000 stoplights, 40,000 loop detectors, 700 cameras. In fact, they run the stoplights here at UCLA. In fact, the whole system was started because of the Olympics that were he held here at UCLA. Yes, they did kick me out of Sproul, told me to go away. In fact, I went to Israel, just so you guys know. Um, when the 1984 Olympics were here, we started computerizing traffic management 
And now the system goes across the entire region and it intermediates traffic, vehicular traffic, light and heavy rail, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, even horses, even equestrian traffic is intermediated. Because at the end of the day, uh, transportation is a big driver for not only quality of life and prosperity and all that, but also, frankly, carbon emissions and sustainability. Um, because even, even, this will look familiar, even though it's from 60 years ago, uh, because we are still trying to avoid things like that. But in the sharing economy, a lot of people have moved to uh, a world where we are literally driving around with apps in our phones. How many people here have used Waze? Okay, and all the Israelis know that it is an Israeli company, right? <laughs> it's even written in the Air Force. Is it? Really? When I was at Qualcomm, I ran strategy for, for Qualcomm, uh, for R&D, and uh, we invest into Waze. Uh, that was how I first heard about it was uh, an Israeli showed up in my office and said, we have to go do this. I'm like, okay, sure, whatever. Um, you always do what they tell you to do, right? And so in LA, uh, we have the largest population of Waze users in North America, maybe the world. There's about two million people here who use Waze. So think about that for a second. If the population, the grow, overall population around here is around eight or nine million people, give or take, uh, you know, within that LA County area, uh, and two million of them are using Waze, that's probably 40% of the targetable, addressable drivers. It's a remarkable number, right? And, and what we do is, is that we, have a, we do a lot with the Waze team at Google. We give them things like construction data, we give them safety data, we give them data about uh, the farmer's markets, uh, the sporting events, um, that very LA thing of film shoots and all that, so that they route people around all these different things. That data is available for free for anybody and all the app users, all the app providers use that. But it allows us to address things like, well, uh, safety first and quality of, quality of life and user experience, but increasingly, it obviously will start to allow us to do things like, you know, uh, sustainability. Can we route people through the transportation system more with a more ecological bent? Uh, and I'll give you some examples. Sitting in traffic is obviously bad for everything, right? Air quality, fuel emissions, all that sort of stuff. But LA also has geography. We have a mountain range in the middle of the city. We have a lot of elevation. I drive an electric car. I have to think about whether do I want to go over the hill because it's going to cost me more energy than if I actually go around it. And it's something that you only think about if you're somebody like me who rides a bike a lot. Not on a tie, but I do ride a bike a lot. And, and, and against the greater context, um, we're also doing a lot with, with infrastructure, physical infrastructure. Tomorrow morning at 7.30 in the morning, we're opening up the light rail from downtown to the Santa Monica Pier. Uh, you, guys, you guys already clapped for the mayor, so you can, <laughs> we, can, we can continue. But that physical infrastructure is also coming with some very important digital infrastructure changes that, that are going alongside. Now, the nice thing about digital infrastructure is, is that they don't cost a billion dollars a mile uh, or you know, uh, to do anything. In fact, you could do a lot of meaningful work. The mayor referenced an app that we did with Xerox called Go LA. Uh, and in the Go LA app, it's a free thing. You can pull it off for Android or iOS or use it on kiosk or get the website, whatever. It all works. Uh, but it has a bunch of different providers in it that when you choose to go from, by the way, I'm wearing a UCLA pen because somebody was nice enough to give it to me today. Uh, you know, I, I figure my tuition here doesn't even, you know, way back when probably doesn't even cost, cover the cost of the pen. But the reality is I'm wearing it because I have to go over to USC later on today. Yeah. <laughs> and I figure I'll wear it because I want to, you know. <laughs> but if I choose to route between UCLA and USC, I have 30 different providers that will tell me all the different ways to get from here to there based on time, expense, and sustainability. And what we mean by sustainability is, uh, well, input and output. How many calories will I burn? And how much CO2 will I emit with my transportation? By the way, that does not include personal emissions, I just want to point out. Um, 
But this app is a very, very useful thing because it's probably the first urban mobility marketplace that has ever been done outside of China. I've only seen it in, in two apps in China. I've never seen it anywhere else. And, and what it is is it lays a framework, not necessarily for car drivers, but for people who are visiting the region to think about how they get around in, in other ways. And we have a lot of shared economy folks participating. We launched with Uber and Lyft, for example. Uber pulled out later in the day because they didn't want to be next to Lyft. But that said, we still do a lot with Uber. It also includes paratransit, includes public transit, includes bike share, includes lots of stuff. And, and another thing that happens is that we're all participating in a sharing economy with these smartphones, you know, because we, to a certain degree we're sharing data whether, whether you know it or not, right? I'm not going to get into the privacy side. We have a basic rule. We don't take personally identifiable information because we don't really need it, except in certain cases, like when you're filing for a building permit or calling 911. But this is a little uh, visualization of data that came from users of an app called Strava. Strava is for bicycling and running. I use it all the time. Here are the most popular bicycle routes across Los Angeles. We never had this data before. The only way you can get this data is by going out there with one of those old clickers and counting the bicycles going by at certain points. And by the way, or doing a survey, hey, did you ride from here to there? Forget it. Here it is. You know, impossible to get data. Uh, and we are getting it because Frankly, people are sharing it with us, not their names, not how fast they are, not how uh, overweight they might be, like, but in this case, because they're riding a bicycle. And uh, it allows transportation planners to do a lot more with it. Um, somebody mentioned Uber. Uh, there was an announcement this afternoon from Uber about uh, the opening of the Expo Line Phase 2 tomorrow, where they are giving $5 off for any trip that begins or ends at one of the new metro stations. Kind of cool, right? I think it's I think it's great. Go Uber, uh, go Lyft, go Uber. You know, I'm not playing favorites at all. <laughs> one is easier to work with, one is not. I won't mention which. Um, <laughs> but I do want to point out something. This is a visualization of how Uber, they're not the easier ones to work with, uh, <laughs> has grown over the last four years here in Los Angeles. We are their biggest market in the United States. So from, it's one of those things that really gets there. And it's obviously entered the social norms because I was on an LAPD helicopter the other week and on the back of the helmet of the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but we're obviously facing more things. And I'm gonna take a, another three or four minutes just to finish something up here. Um, but the, uh, we're obviously facing in transportation, we're, we're looking at self-driving cars. And you'll notice the mayor, uh, we put him into a self-driving Volvo to go over to the LA Auto Show last November. But most importantly, we look at this as being a disruptive trans technology transformation that can affect all sorts of things. Right now, how many people in this room have cars? Uh, have a car. What are your cars doing right now? Yeah, they're, they're doing nothing, right? You use them 4% of the time. And if it's a self-driving car, uh, well, when you're done helping me, why don't you go toodle off and do something useful somewhere else, right? So maybe we need fewer of them, which means that maybe we have fewer on the, on the roads, which means that maybe we dedicate less real estate. We have, uh, by the way, self-driving cars usually don't run over people. There was a great patent application that came out of Google today about when a self-driving car hits a pedestrian, they have it the pedestrians stick to the hood of the car. Um, <laughs> go figure that one out, which is kind of cool. But, but the thing about it is, is that within a sharing economy, now we start to share the vehicles in addition to the roads. And, and I'll go from there, because right now, we are not sharing vehicles, but we are sharing roads, and we end up with something that looks like this. Um, and it's not so, not so wonderful, uh, if you will. And I'm just gonna close by just bringing up a little bit of stuff around data. Um, we have a, uh, for everybody who's from out of town, we have a system called 311. 311, I'm sure you've heard of 911, which is the emergency system. 311 is when you're reporting some problem that the city should go fix. A pothole, uh, running water, uh, a rat infestation, whatever, right? Well, we publish the data for all the 311 calls we get. When you're talking about a clean city, 
you know, a equitable city? Uh, well, here's data that comes from the real world about the types of calls that we get. And it goes straight to the heart of things like smarter and sustainable cities because this is crowdsourced data, if you will. Uh, and we get very similar data from the app providers every two minutes, for example, in ways. They give us all the reports, no personally identifiable information about the potholes and the trees and the traffic collisions and so on. And I'll just finish with one thing. We um, are also crowdsourcing, as I mentioned that cities are, are examples of the sharing economy. And I mentioned that cities, we live in cities to be safe, first and foremost. So we are also crowdsourcing CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And what I mean by that is, is that there's an app that we uh, uh, work with called Pulse Point. It's from a, a nonprofit that was started up in San Ramon, California. And when somebody calls 911 and says that somebody's having a cardiac arrest, a heart attack, the people who have the app and no CPR get a notification so that they can be a good Samaritan and help out by, you know, frankly, rendering assistance. And that little map over on the right-hand side is just a snapshot of all the people who are registered in LA who are, frankly, have the app and say, I'll do CPR for somebody. There are a lot more of them than we have of firefighters, for example, and paramedics and so on. And so it's a really interesting thing when you start to get into the sharing economy of all the different things that you can now start to crowdsource that have been provided by single providers. Thank you so much.